quite think, well, what does it mean? So, uh, I hope everybody is curious uh, to know what it's about. Um, the, the new University of Color is a new group started, uh, because, well, I actually heard, like, uh, half of Amsterdam is uh, uh, from different backgrounds and coming from all different countries. And when you look at the stuff and at the study material, it's always, yeah, always about Europe and there's many uh, white people. And we are like, okay, well, that's interesting, but how, where, where are the, all these other uh, countries come from and what are these people like? So, um, and what Gloria Wecker is going to talk about is also the possible implications for this and the uh, possible consequences of this uniformity that we see in the university as well as stuff and the study material and what this uh, term decolonization means. So, um, yeah, to give some background, she's uh, at the moment a professor of anthropology at the University of Utrecht and she's specialized in all sorts of things like uh, gender, uh, Caribbean studies, Ameri uh, African American studies, and she's also uh, a vice president, no, let me get this right, executive director of GEM, that's a center of expertise in the field of gender, ethnicity, and multiculturality. So therefore, the people of color is about more diversity, so I think she's the perfect um, speaker to introduce us and, uh, well, I'm not going to hold you much longer, and I'm going to... Is there a live stream? Is there a live stream? No, I, that's on, uh... no but we are recording. Okay. Oh, it's going to be recorded and it's going to get put online. Uh, one more technical thing, uh, she will speak about 25 minutes, and so keep your questions for after 25 minutes, and yeah, then you're free to ask. We're going to have a Q&A till 8, so first, first half, uh, is the lecture, second half is for questions. Okay, uh, give a warm applause for Gloria Becker. Um, good evening and welcome everyone. I'm really pleased to uh, have been invited to the new university, and the University of Color specifically. I should say that um, all the interesting things that uh, Mark said about me are kind of in the past. I'm Professor Emeritus. I used to be the director of um, this expertise center, GEM, Gender, Ethnicity and Multiculturality, at the University of Utrecht. And um, I um, am still professor of gender and ethnicity, but emeritus. Um, I find this uh, a very important initiative that people have come together to form um, a university of color. I have to say that I'm elated because um, this has been a struggle that I have been involved with uh, like maybe uh, for the past 30 years. And so it's very uh, um, elating to see that uh, a younger generation is picking up on it. Um, I want to talk with you tonight ab um, about three things. Um, unfortunately, I didn't have time to make a, a PowerPoint presentation, so I hope I'll be clear enough so you can follow. There are three uh, themes that I will talk about. First, um, I want to talk about a dominant white self-image that I have summed up by calling it white innocence. It's a dominant white uh, self-image with regard to race slash ethnicity. Then I'm going to ask how does that dominant white self-image manifest in the academy, how can we notice it? And um, I will there, in this, under the second point, also get into the unreflected and largely self-evident dominance of whiteness. And then thirdly, I will talk about towards a decolonial university. So those are the three topics 
that I will engage with. And all these three topics are um, a matter of, uh, like what we would say in Dutch, fluken in the kerk, like I'm cursing in church. <laughs> it's uh, quite not done to tackle race so head on. Um, we like to tell ourselves in the Netherlands that race doesn't play a part in the Netherlands. Race is done elsewhere, in the United States, in South Africa, wherever, but not in the Netherlands. Um, so it's going to be quite a challenge that is ahead of us to make race something that we recognize as a forceful power in society and thus also in the academy. I want to start with a um, quote by um, uh, Saidia Hartman, who was here in 2013 when we were celebrating the 150 year abolition of slavery. She has written a number of very beautiful and worthwhile books and um, she has written one among them is uh, the book called Lose Your Mother in which she goes uh, to Ghana. She's an African-American historian and cultural theorist. She goes to Ghana to look for her roots. Um, then she says about the afterlife of slavery the following, and she is addressing a North American context. Slavery had established a measure of man and a ranking of life and worth that has yet to be undone. If slavery persists as an issue in the life of black America, it is not because of an antiquarian obsession with bygone days or the burden of a too long memory, but because black lives are still imperiled and devalued by a racial calculus and a political arithmetic that were entrenched centuries ago. This is the afterlife of slavery, skewed life chances, limited access to health and education, premature death, incarceration and impoverishment. I'm going to uh, gloss this now so you can get um, a closer view at what it is she's actually saying about North America, but as I'm maintaining, this is also, maybe to a lesser extent, but that is yet to be seen, true in the Netherlands. So she's saying, black lives are still in danger, they are imperiled, and they are devalued by a racial calculus and a political uh, method of uh, reckoning that have been installed centuries ago. And the consequences of this political arithmetic are unequal chances in life, limited access to health and to education, premature death, prison and poverty. I'm talking about black, and I mean it um, to encompass uh, black migrant and refugee people in the Netherlands, people of color, people of ethnic minorities. Um, I um, avoid the most commonly circulating term in the Netherlands, allochtonen, which supposedly is an innocuous term, but which enables people to speak about race without having to take the distasteful term into our mouth. So we're not going to speak about autochtonen and allochtonen. Uh, furthermore, how long do you uh, have to be here to be uh, reckoned as autochtone? You may have been here 60 years, yet you're not autochtone. So I would like to keep those terms aside. I'm going to speak about black migrant and refugee people. And on each of the terrains that Hartman distinguishes, whether it's the labor market, health, uh, uh, education, it is the case that 
people from ethnic minority groups are doing worse. Um, so, um, I, I'm implicitly talking about institutional racism, a system in which people of color are devalued. And so it, it goes for Turkish, Moroccan, Surinamese, Italian, whatever groups that are deemed to be not from here. And though the racism against these different groups um, looks differently and has different emphases, um, I think um, it, it would be fair to say that the reservoir from which these um, prejudices and uh, daily discriminations come originally are based on the system of slavery and that um, other permutations have been added to different groups. But very basic is the fact that the Netherlands has had a colonial empire for almost 400 years and my most fundamental question in these issues is how is it the case that we can think in the Netherlands and flatter ourselves to think that we have been an empire for 400 years yet that it wouldn't have left any traces in our history, in our language, in the way we think about ourselves and the other. This is an, uh, an uh, there is a tension between those two things that is untenable and that, as I hope, is one of the um, impetuses for you to, to be here tonight, to start to think about how we can tackle this in the academy. So, my first topic uh, about a dominant white self-image that I have called white innocence. So I've been uh, busy these past two years with a book that is called White Innocence, Paradoxes of Race and Colonialism, which will be published in a couple of months by Duke University Press. In it, I'm interested in the widely uh, spread but understudied ways in which race has nestled itself in the Dutch cultural archive. Um, the Dutch cultural archive is a place, um, it is a concept that has been coined by Edward Said in cultural and culture and imperialism in 1993, in which um, he says of Western European nations generally that there was the idea that uh, Western European nations had um, a mission. They had uh, acquired the right to spread beyond their own domain, to go to um, uh, nations of the south or um, underdeveloped <coughs> nations to civilize them. They had taken upon themselves uh, this uh, mission civilisatrice to spread civilization and it was clear that this was the sacred mission of these Western European nations. So you can derive from that in, that in order to entertain such thoughts one has to have a distinct feeling of superiority about oneself uh, that one is called to undertake this civilizing mission and that the others are way behind and need to be brought um, into the stream of civilization. Um, what I'm interested in, in this project of white innocence, is to see the forcefulness, the passion and the aggression um, that race elicits in the Netherlands, while simultaneously denial and disavowal reign supreme. So you have this very toxic combination of passion, aggression, anger, 
and at the same time denial and disavowal. I only have to mention the term Zwarte Piet for you to see how those two are operative simultaneously. And you may very well be uh, in a good position to ask, so if it is true that Zwarte Piet hasn't got anything to do with racism, whence the anger, the passion, um, the aggression that um, he elicits. Um, I went to do my PhD at UCLA in, uh, at the end of the 80s, and I returned to the Netherlands in 1992, and to me that was a very significant moment in that I came to see the Netherlands with fresh eyes as the emperor without his clothes on. Um, I, I saw the emperor in all of his ugliness um, uh, and he was more ugly than I and all of us have been led to believe. Race is very much a part of this emperor, this metaphorical emperor that I use for the Netherlands, it rears its head in unexpected and also in expected places and moments, sometimes literally as the return of the repressed. While the dominant discourse doggedly maintains that we have always been colorblind and anti-racist. So there is a denial and a disavowal of race. So disavowal is a psychoanalytical concept that wants to say that in the same breath uh, a thought or a desire can be acknowledged but it is also denied at the same time. There's a deep ambiguity with regard to race. Um, but the dominant Dutch self-image that I've summed up with white innocence is we do not do race. Um, we have always been on the morally upright side of racial issues, a guiding light to other nations. Um, there is a lot when you, you go back into history and read um, the Gids, for example, uh, a, a journal of the uh, bourgeoisie in which many issues regarding to colonialism were being dealt with you find this self-flattery in the pages of this journal in which, for example, an author can say um, that it is highly fortunate that we, the quietest people of Europe, were put together with the quietest people of Asia, and that is uh, Indonesia, or as it was called at the time, our Indies. So there is a lot of self-flattery, self-congratulation, on how good we are, that we are on the right side of things. So the question I ask is, um, so how is it possible to have had this empire for 400 years and to flatter ourselves into thinking that this wouldn't have left traces? And so I've concluded in my book on the basis of um, studies in popular culture, looking at the content of television, of novels, the way education and government are organized, phenomenon of Black Pete and, and several other case studies, that race must have been very firmly implanted in the Dutch cultural imaginary to have left such virulent and systematic psychic residue. Okay, then we go on to um, reflect on the self-evident, uh, the self-evidence of the dominance of whiteness in the university. Um, knowledge with regard to race, the work that race does in society in allocating people to particular positions, um, in um, dividing scarce resources, in giving us images 
that precede and that determine how we look at somebody on the basis of how they look, all of those residues are hardly being studied in the Netherlands. Recently we have seen an upsurge of uh, some very hopeful uh, initiatives like some summer schools of decolonial studies have sprung up in the past decade, uh, organized for instance by Ninsei, but lo and behold, Ninsei couldn't manage to uh, live through its 10th year, uh, then the government deemed it wise to abolish it. There is a summer school starting at, at the Free University um, this coming summer. And there are some very hopeful initiatives such as this, the seeming start of a second wave of anti-racist thought and activity and also in this University of Color that you have been uh, organizing in. And I think these are very important and hope-giving initiatives. I, it is absolutely necessary that we gain insights and knowledge in the way that race works, specifically in the way that whiteness functions as a conglomerate of unearned privileges. Um, and that kind of study has been done in the United States, in the UK. What we study here is the other. The places in the university where race or ethnicity is studied is in institutes of ethnic <coughs> studies and then we mean how are Turks and Moroccans doing in the labor market, what is happening um, with regard to health, uh, how many students of color are, are there in the university. We do not study whiteness and its privileges. Um, so the self is not studied, the white self is not considered relevant. Whiteness in the Netherlands is mostly concerned nothing. It's an empty signifier. Um, it is without meaning. It is, as many of my students say, it is gewoon, you know, it's ordinary, without paying attention to the privileges that whiteness brings with it. And I um, don't have much time to, to um, show you how whiteness works as an allocation of position, um, but um, Peggy McIntosh um, in the late 80s compiled a list of about 90 items uh, from which you can um, 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 deduct what whiteness is and how it works. So just to name some examples. She asks, um, can I go to the store and be sure that the store detective doesn't follow me? Can I turn on the television and be sure that the group to which I belong uh, is portrayed in a favorable matter, manner. Can I go to the university and be sure that I will find courses that are of interest to me? You will see easily, this list can be extended, that all of those questions self-evidently can be answered with yes by white people, not so for people of color. Uh, my colleague at the University of, Ange uh, of um, Utrecht, uh, cultural psychologist David Ingleby, said in um, his inaugural address, and that was somewhere in the 90s, when we look at our curricula in the social sciences, and I'm adding, I'm afraid that uh, that curriculum in the social sciences shines with inclusivity when we compare it to the curriculum in the humanities, let alone the other um, the hard sciences. He's saying, when we look at our curricula in the social sciences, we behave in the Netherlands as if we are still living in the 50s. We have drawn the curtains 
and we are sitting with our backs to the windows and we act as Dutch society has not changed in the past 70 years and has not become multiracial. So we are dealing with a situation in the Netherlands, with an academic situation in the Netherlands, where it has become normal practice in, in many disciplines to look at the work of gender. Uh, this is largely due to the work that the discipline of women's studies has done. We look at the way gender works, for instance, in processes of identity formation, in the allocation of scarce resources within economy. Um, we look at gender in history, but that still is not the case for race, ethnicity. Also, notice that when we are talking about these imported axes of signification that are doing their work out there, but also within ourselves, I'm talking about gender, race, ethnicity, class, sexuality, there are others, but I'll limit myself to those four. We have organized it so that these four axes of signification are studied in different disciplines, so they never necessarily come together. So the work that I'm doing and have been doing is to think these axes simultaneously. So we have organized it so that uh, gender, yes, is taken by many to be an important axis of signification. It, it influences our reality, um, but not so with race, ethnicity. The presence and functioning of racializing processes is one of the best kept secrets in Dutch society and thus also in the Dutch academy. Whether you look at sociology or psychology in the social sciences and the humanities in general, there is an absence of attention to race. And this, of course, is also connected to the distribution of personnel in the academy, which is still overwhelmingly white and male. It should not be the case that when the practitioners of a particular discipline are predominantly white males, that then no questions about either gender or race or class or sexuality can be posed. But unfortunately, this is still the case. And it also points directly to the importance of not only our student bodies, but also the bodies of teaching personnel at the university be as diverse as possible. And that goes also for all kinds, for all sectors in society. Uh, because we should not continue with maintaining this mono-ethnic, mono-racial, mono-gendered, mono-cultural state of affairs. And the university, unfortunately, even though it prides itself on, on being one of the most progressive institutions in society, really lags behind. So let's look in a bit more detail to the racializing processes uh, taking place in the academy. The dominant discourse in the, the, the academy, uh, as far as uh, higher education is concerned, is that